Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, maybe for some people. Hi, my name is Vivian Aqua, and I'm the host of Let's Humanize the Workplace. And I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug a little bit, just a little bit. I've been nominated in the Netherlands for the You Go Girl Award. So please vote for me so that, you know, your girl wins something, wins an award. But besides that, I'm not going to do a lot of plugging today. I am, however going to share a few things, a few topics that can be relevant for today's conversation. So the Golden Globes, I don't know who watched it. I know that it wasn't on television because of, well, diversity challenges and also the fact that a lot of sponsors, big sponsors dropped out because of the controversy around the Golden Globes. Um, I hope that the Golden Globes will come back with a better diversity representation in all layers, right? But this is the situation, what's happening right now. And what can happen to the Golden Globes can also happen to your company or your organization or your team. So I want you to marinate on that as well. And another thing that I would like to address is... Um, I saw this post this morning and I noticed that 60 Seconds did a, uh, did a piece on the Great Resignation. And for the people that don't know Dan Price, look him up on Twitter because he has an amazing story. I'm not going to share his story, but I'll share a brief summary. He's a CEO that earns $70,000. In fact, everybody within his company is earning that. And the fact that he's sharing that he doesn't have a great resignation uh, example. No, instead, he is showing love. And he's also challenging other leaders, other companies to show love. Because the shortest on job is the way that we respect people, right? So I wanted to highlight that. Before I'm going to introduce the guest speakers of today, and like I said, right, for those of you who know Sierra, you must know this song, Level Up. And if you don't know, Google it, Sierra, Level Up. This is a team that I want to amplify in 2022. And I am so excited to have Torin, to have Marcia, to have Sergio from all over the world here to have this conversation. So with no further ado, I will bring them up one by one and also have their bio ready. Let me do that proper introduction. So first of all, I have Torin Ellis. He leads a progressive boutique regarding critically diversity and inclusion. He operates as an activist entrepreneur. I basically see him as the Eric Thomas within the DEI. If you don't know Eric Thomas, Google him because he's practically a motivational speaker uh, within the within the, the speaker field and I see Torin as similar. Marsha Goddard, she is a neuroscientist on a mission to bring science into the workplace and break the stereotypes. So one thing that I really have to share about Marsha is I have known a few share of neuroscientists and Marsha is one of the very few people that makes neuroscientists science, fun, engaging, inspiring, and not boring as the majority of some of the people that I've gotten to know. I'm not saying all, <laughs> but people, you have to spice it up. And one of the ways that she's using, she's tricking people to read into her Formula One. So I've been anti Formula One. And because, what, well, she's one of the reasons why I'm more of a, more into Formula One. I'm still Lewis fan. I know Max won, but I'm still a Lewis fan and connect with her, read her story because she's sharing amazing things. And last but not least, Sergio Pandey, he is determined to increase the ethnic diversity across the senior corporate layers together with 50 mentors coming from ethnic minority backgrounds themselves. And Sergio is the co-founder of Roots Inspire. I am going to be honest, right? I'm going to share my age. For those of you who know me, you know my age, but I'm 41. I wish that when I started my career, I had something like Sergio because the fact that I'm seeing people from different backgrounds are in certain positions that I could not see myself for possible, that is amazing. So I have, it, it feels like I'm, I'm holding a wrestling match, a positive one, positive wrestling match with every corner. I have superstars on every corner. So thank you all for being here. And I have to ask you the following question. Why do we need to humanize the workplace? And I'll start with you, Marcia. All right, then. Um, so 
Yeah, I think with everything that's been going on in the world and, and the way issues have been polarized to no end, everyone is craving a little bit of humanity and a little bit of connection right now. Uh, but even more importantly, I think is that, you know, with, with the office, the workplace uh, becoming hybrid or in some cases even fully remote, I don't think we're ever going back to whatever was normal in the past. You really run a serious risk of losing all humanity when you're mm -hmm. only in this virtual space all the time. And we have all these digital tools that allow us to communicate at a distance. And that's great because it, it, it keeps us safe from COVID in this case. Mm -hmm. But we kind of have to make sure that we don't forget that we're not all square boxes on a screen. We're not 2D images. We, we're people with personalities and feelings and we have layers. Um, but that's more difficult to share remotely which means that we need to level up in humanizing the workplace so that we don't forget that we're dealing with people and not bits, zeros and ones. Will, will it help to beam myself up to a, a location, which can be possible, right? There is a way for you to make a 3D element of yourself where you can portray yourself in an office where people can see you from head to toe. Will that help? I think it, that might be even weirder for your brain. Like I always look at it from like a neuroscientific perspective. For example, all of us together right now, it's impossible for us to make eye contact because if I want to make mm -hmm. eye contact, I have to do yeah. this, which yeah. is, I mean, yeah. I'm not seeing you. Yeah. So I think yeah. with a 3D image, your brain will be like, what is that? No, get it away from me. It's, I, I'm not sure. Okay. For those of you who have a 3D image, maybe you need, we need to test it to really see what's happening here. So thank Let's you. Ask Tom. Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> not at this moment. Torin, thank you, Marsha. Torin? Yeah, speaking of Zuckerberg, I, I think about artificial intelligence. I think about mm -hmm. uh, blockchain. I think about platform companies, how they continue to push how we live, work, and play. I think about the fact that we have billionaires going into outer space just to have some fun for two, three, four minutes, and then they come back down to mm -hmm. a country where we still have babies in cages at uh, the border, wow. where we still have folks yeah. from Haitian under bridges. Yeah. Where we still have activist children in California and New York walking out because their administrators can't get it right in terms of the pandemic and them being in school. I think yeah. about we fighting for voting rights here in this country in 2022. So why do we need to hum humanize the workplace? Because that whole culture conversation, it starts inside of people's condition and their circumstance. Like it's cute for us to think if we put posters on the wall, we throw some nice little phrases up on social media, we hire a chief diversity officer or something of the sort, that everything is going to just magically be all right. But it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It works in the fact that when I wake up and I put my feet on the floor, I wake up inside of my condition and my circumstance yeah. and I bring all of that to the workplace. So I think leadership needs to be a bit more understanding around that word that Marsha used, humanity. Yeah, I love that. And while you were sharing something about the chief diversity officers, right? Um, I've been binge watching Scandal. And one thing that a chief diversity officer is not they are not Olivia Pope where they can fix everything and magically make everything disappear. So all the yuckiness that is happening, a chief, a, a chief diversity officer can, is not a magician, is not Harry Potter, is not Viola Davis in How to Get Away with Murder. You, you can get my frame of what I'm watching at the moment right now. But it's these are real life cases that a chief a CDO, a CDO needs money needs resources, needs a team, needs buy-in, and needs so many other more. But I'm handing over, thank you, Tori, I'm handing over the mic to Sergio. Yeah, because one thing I want to add to that is that uh, it's also not a place where you park your problems. Mm. Right? And I think that's often what it's used for. Because this whole diversity thing, it's super complex. Right? Yeah. It's it's humanity and, you know, how the brain works. I'd love to hear more from, from Marcia. But a lot of these things are just natural behavior that we're dealing with and that are maybe not coming to the best of society, right? And, and um, if it's too complex, what people do is they say, okay, I hire somebody to take care of that and then it's not my problem anymore and now you fix it. 
Yeah. Right. So that's that's definitely not the approach. But to me, um, in this complexity, I like to bring it back to, for me, the core, and that's maximizing potential. Mm-hmm. We're trying to maximize potential of society. We're trying to maximize potential of the individuals in society, which then you know leads to a bigger pie for all of us, a better life for all of us. And um, yeah, so that's sort of my compass in, in this whole discussion. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Vivian, if I could, can I just throw a couple more words out there? You know, mm-hmm. we, we've shared uh, in, synchronous, uh, in, in synchronicity the word humanity. It, it's yeah. been woven in right now. But I, but I want to add to that. I, I think if we're going to do this work right, if, if we're going to level up our organizations, our teams, business units, departments, empathy, intentionality, proximity, and transparency. Mm-hmm. Especially empathy, that last one. Yeah. Empathy, intentionality, proximity. Yeah. We got to get close yeah. in that transparency. We got to be honest. And yeah. for the rest of the time today, trust me, as we open our mouth, we are going to be honest. Definitely, definitely. So in the beginning, I was talking about the great resignation, right? And in the Netherlands, I think every country here in the Western society is talking about people leaving their companies. Whilst there is also um, an immigration challenge that every every country is having right now. And it's so weird that we are in 2022 and we are not thinking outside of the box. We are not activating people, their super talents or the superpowers to Maybe it's possible for an immigrant to work here. Maybe it's possible for somebody who doesn't speak uh, the language or isn't from here can can apply certain things that they learned in their country, right? So I'm curious to hear your take on that, uh, Torin. Yeah, I, I I don't see what the issue is. You know, listen, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 and suggesting that our borders should be just porous and wide open that we, you know, should... I, I'm not suggesting that we need to stop all people from coming into the country, but I also don't feel like we do a good enough job of making it making it palatable, making it realistic that mm-hmm. people have a pathway towards entry, towards citizenship. Yeah. Here's the truth of the matter. There's not a whole lot of folks that are watching this broadcast right now that want to do a lot of the work that immigrants are doing here in mm-hmm. our country. I can't yes. speak for another country. But yeah, not a lot of same. people watching want to do the work that many of them are hired, relegated, forced to do. Yeah. So I don't understand how we are having a conversation around immigration, not wanting people to be in the country. But then on the other side, ignoring the fact that we don't really have a workforce that wants to go out and pick strawberries. They don't want to do. I did corn detesting when I was in high school. So I know what it's like to work in a farm field environment. That's not easy work. Getting up at 16 years old at three, four in the morning, getting on a tractor, pulling corn, going home with blisters and cut up hands every single day, all because I wanted to be fresh in high school. But I was willing to do that. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. So I need to, we, we need to change the conversation around immigration. Thank you. Sergio, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, what's interesting about um, this whole topic, if, if you look at Europe, right? like I grew up in, maybe for the audience, I grew up in the Netherlands. Right? I have a corporate banking background. I, I um, in Europe first, out of Amsterdam, and then in Asia, out of, out of Singapore. And this whole, you know, the, the problems that come from our problems, the, the, the things that come with immigration is that now you come to a second and even third generation, right? So where the first generation is maybe happy to, you know, work in the field and say, okay, well, I chose this myself. I have a better life. I I went for the opportunity. Now the kids, you know, they're a bit in between. They're like, okay, but I was born here. And yes, my, my mom and dad were from somewhere else. And, but now you come to a third generation and they're like, what immigrant, you know, that's like, two generations ago. I am Mm -hmm. a citizen here. I have all the rights. I am uh, all the rights that everybody has. And I'm I'm claiming my spot. And I think that's what we see now with the the young ones coming up. And that's why when we look at BLM, 
you know, it's such a fierce discussion because the sense of belonging is is one of the most powerful things. Um, and they absolutely have the right, the same rights as everybody else that was born in that country. Thank you. Marcia. Yeah, it made me think of a <clears throat> something that I've pondered for years already is when you come to a country as an immigrant, for some reason, at least here in the Netherlands, you're only allowed to come here if you're fleeing from war or fleeing mm -hmm. from certain death or something. If you come here looking for better opportunities for yourself, then people will be like, no, you're not. No, you cannot just come here to look for better opportunities. And that always made me wonder, why not? <laughs> why? Why not? Is it like we have some sort of, we feel like we have some sort of birthright because we were born here. Other people cannot come here looking for a better future for themselves. That doesn't make any sense to me. So the whole discussion around immigration to me has always been strange because if you come here and you have something to offer to me, like why wouldn't we welcome them? There's just no logical reason not to, aside from biases, which I'm sure we will get into at some point, but <laughs> that's the thing. There's no, it, it doesn't make any sense for people to say, you're an immigrant, so you shouldn't be able to work here. And even, you know, now you have people coming here who are doctors who cannot even find a job because, a job, yeah. because they're immigrants, because they have yeah. a foreign sounding name. So. And, 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 and how did we start? We started with billionaires going into outer space. So across <laughs> the entire world, white men have found a way to insert themselves into that geography trying to claim it to be their own. And, and listen, I'm not suggesting that we not go out of space because I know that in one of those trips, at least one, there was a heavy emphasis on research, like the suits were suited so that they could yeah. gain information from the environment and all that. other. So I get it. I absolutely get necessarily going up and it not only being a joy ride, but it being some sort of recon mission and expedition. But the fact that they are going out of space and celebrating that and mad because people that they are seeing and can touch being less human to them, problematic. And the fact that folks don't see that as being problematic is doubly problematic. Also, also look into the companies, right? The companies that they represent, how are they treating their people and how much money is actually being blown out of space and how much of that money is being invested on creating a better environment on, on planet earth. I, I understand that, you know, out, out of space and going to a different planet, it's really exciting. I mean, I went to Barcelona and even got a snippet of the moon, with, which inspired me to level up my own way of thinking. But then again, why are we so fixated on to finding a new planet earth? while we have challenges here on earth, right? So I, I totally understand that. I'm seeing a lot of comments, good comments. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some of the comments. So Craig is sharing, we are all different. Yes, we definitely are. Anne is sharing AI is code bias in a black box. And then we are really at risk losing humanity at business decisions. Yes, definitely. I do have to share that not all AI is bad, but the majority, I can agree on, on certain levels of this. Patrick is sharing the problem causing conflict in the virtual world is the same as in face-to-face. -face. It's still our judgmental attitude that prevents us from accessing our higher selves and our common humanity. And that that's a good, a good thing to have a conversation about. So Sergio, how would you, how, how would you address this part as in the fact that we, even though we are working remote, some people feel much more safer, as in myself and I, feel much more safer as in working remote, but there will come a day and time where we are going to see each other face to face. How are we going to solve these challenges? How are you solving these challenges? Yeah, you mean what, with getting back to the workplace? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to imagine, right? Because we're mm -hmm. we're in this for two years and for, you know, I'm also 40 plus now. Um, for us, it's sort of- a, What does that mean? Little... Is, is it, is, are we written off as a 40 plus people? 
it means that we have a lot of experience before all this stuff happens. Mm, okay, right? okay, okay. But with sort of the new generation coming in and yeah. coming into this, you know, like like I remember I had colleagues that I've never even seen face to face, right? Yeah. And you feel like, oh, you're the new guy, but they're there mm-hmm. already six months, right? So, yeah. so I think for us, like having having the experience, like the longer term experience before that. It will be much easier to adjust, um, but those that have come in now, like I really wonder what the gaps are going to be five years mm-hmm. from now, right? Like in in the development where you don't have the benefit of, you know, leaning over to the desk next to you and say, "Hey, I'm struggling with this thing. How how does that work?" Now now you have to book a call with somebody or pick up the phone, and so the hurdles for all these type of things are much larger. Um, so yeah, there will be gaps. There will be gaps, and um, it's it's going to be interesting to see. Very interesting, Marcia. Yeah. Before I get into this, I want to acknowledge what Anna Will said. Anna Will is my former boss, by the way. She's a, she's a <laughs> Hi, Anna Will. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, she uh, one of the one of the documentaries, Coded Bias, which you, you may mm-hmm. know, addresses this topic, and it is really. Yeah. It, I was really shocked when I saw mm-hmm. how you know how it can be used for bad and not for good if we're not if we're not aware of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to the workplace and going back to the office, if it ever happens, I think I've been studying co- company culture and leadership and what do you need in order for your organization to be healthy for about five six years now, so pre COVID. And I think all the things that mattered before are even more important now. So as a leader, you need to give people autonomy. You need to give people trust. You need to create psychological safety. You need to be vulnerable. You need to be transparent. You need to be congruent, consistent in your decision. Okay, a little slower pace. Sorry. In your sorry. mind, you're going like a train. And I'm just like, okay, as a leader, autonomy. Right. Important. Yes. Trust. Mm-hmm. Trust. Psychological safety. Mm, being vulnerable yeah. yourself so showing yeah. that you are a human because we're yes. again we're forgetting that we're on a screen which sort of dehumanizes us because there's hardly any nonverbal communication so being vulnerable mm-hmm. and in your decision making being transparent being congruent and being consistent we need more of that that needs more emphasis when we go back because it's going to be like we're starting over like we're just getting to know each other and people are yeah. going to be insecure and not really knowing how to behave. It's, it's, it's going to be weird because it will be the old normal, but by the time we're back, it will be the new normal. To be honest, yeah. I, I also have some doubts as to whether we're ever really going back to the office. I don't think, I think that ship has sailed to really going back to the way it was before. I don't think that's going to happen because of the upsides of what we're living through right now. There are some upsides to it as well. And I think we need to find a way to keep those while getting back to the social connection that we're missing right now. Torin, do you agree? Yeah, I do. I actually, I want to go back to the uh, comment around AI as well. Uh, I believe her name was Anna. And Anna, I would ask that you or encourage you to visit the AI Now Institute. They have Mm -hmm. a report out called Discriminating Systems of Bias. And it really, really talks about how AI is in some ways discriminating against under, uh, underrepresented and marginalized communities, but it also provides a bit of solution as to a pathway, uh, a pathway forward. Yes, I absolutely agree that we are in a forever new normal. And mm-hmm. I think the simplest way for us to look at this is that we just can't approach almost anything. We can't approach much of what we looked at in terms of work in the way that we saw it before. Sure, the work must continue to get done, but can it get done in pods? Can it get done in sprints? Can it get done in smaller windows of time? Does it have yeah. to be a four-day four, four, uh, four day work week? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be a four-day work week because for many individuals, they're just simply going to try to cram the 60 or 80 hours that they were accustomed to into those four days. So I want people to feel like they have the autonomy, the freedom to just simply do what needs to be done. I Mm -hmm. have not had a boss in 23 years, but I'm still highly productive. So people know how to do what needs to be done. And if in fact they are not delivering on their role, hold them accountable. It's really not that hard. We try to make things hard. We want to come up with these cute phrases. Somebody wants to be the person that 
uh, has a, uh, you know, a phrase that goes viral because they become the new management guru and mm -hmm. the biggest consultant. Look, I don't care about none of that bullshit. All I care about is I want you to do good work, build high yeah. performing teams, build incredible business units, build incredible departments, build profitable organizations and do that in the way like like the young people used to say, get in where you fit in. Yeah. Go where you are celebrated. Right. OK, now I feel like a, a, a creepy quietness. So <laughs> let's let let's let's get into let's get into DEI, Sergio. Uh, no, I'll start with Marsha. Marsha, yeah. what is the one thing that you would advise managers, leaders or companies or um, the people, the individuals themselves? What do they need to activate this year? Their own self-awareness would be the mm. first one that comes to mind for me. I mean, if you want it, actually do it. And don't say you want it when you don't really want it. If you want it, you have to make room at the table. You have to be willing to make room at the table. And you have to be willing to reflect on your own bias. You have it. I have it. You have it. We all have it. We all have bias. And that is absolutely fine and absolutely human and absolutely normal. But the way out of it is in order to be aware of it and then take steps to mitigate it. But that does mean that you have to be willing to do it. So... I think the main thing, the main struggle right now is tokenism. Mm. You know, we will hire the CDO and we will do what we have to do. We will do Blackout Tuesday or whatever the, the fad is at the moment. Um, and then we, we keep it at that. We don't actually solve the problems. Yeah. And the, the one thing also that I want to emphasize is you can focus on diversity, but if you don't focus on inclusion, nothing is going to change. You can, you can tap into new underrepresented marginalized groups and bring them all into your organization at entry level. Um, and then they're going to walk right out the back door because you're not an inclusive environment. So if you don't mm -hmm. focus on, I always say focus on inclusion first, which is a culture is issue, a company yeah. culture issue. So we need to do, I can talk about this for three hours. But this is, this is basically <laughs> when, when a company is focusing on diversity, it's basically bringing all the pizza ingredients in yeah. and laying it there on the table and assuming that the pizza will bake itself. Because if you haven't set the oven, if you haven't set the kitchen, and if you've not cleaned the kitchen to make it special, and also not using the right utensils to bake your amazing pizza, I am not responsible for you thinking about pizza. I'm only using this as an example, because this is what's happening in the workplace at the moment right now. So thank you, Marsha, for sharing that, because... Uh, that is really important. I'm also curious about from a Formula One perspective, what is a must that you learned last year, whether Lewis, it doesn't matter Lewis or, or Max, I'm open to both. <laughs> Masha knows how I feel about certain people, so I'm open to both. What is the lesson that you learned when it comes to DEI and you tie it into Formula One? Well, I mean, I, I do these D and I workshops all the time. Right. And the, mm -hmm. the quote that I always I called the, the workshop embracing differences. And I got mm -hmm. the title from a quote by Lewis. Lewis is amazing. Mm -hmm. What he does mm -hmm. on track is amazing. What he does off track is amazing. And he said to embrace your differences, to understand your potential. Yeah. And I think. Formula One is not good at this, by the way. I, I did not learn very much about DEI from Formula One. I learned a lot about high performing teams from Formula One, but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you take a sip there. Uh, but not necessarily about diversity and inclusion. I do know, you know, speaking to people on teams, they it's it's something that they want. But you mm -hmm. have to keep in mind that they were like the furthest away from it because it was a yeah. rich white boys sport. That's just what it was. And Lewis changed all of that. So what I have seen is that if there is willingness, there are opportunities. Even a sport as far from DNI as Formula One is, Mercedes is changing. They're taking real steps to change. I didn't take any like lessons from how to do it from them because I think they need to learn from others. Mm -hmm. But I think it does show that if you really want it and you, if you have, it helps to have somebody as inspiring as Lewis, obviously, to do yeah. it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the quote to embrace your differences, to understand your potential. That's something that I got from him that I use all the time. Thank you. Torin, what did you learn from last year that you people have to activate this year? Yeah. So um, the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl in 2013. Mm -hmm. Weeks after they won the Super Bowl, uh, the quarterback, the then quarterback, Joe Flacco, received a contract for $100 million dollars. 
Now, I'm not a, uh, 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 an athlete in any way. Um, I played a little bit in junior high school, high school, but I'm in no way an athlete. In some ways, I'm not qualified to, to comment on his ability. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like he was worth $100 million. Mm. So I stopped watching football after the Ravens, the team here in my city, won the Super Bowl the very next year is when Colin Kaepernick took a knee. I mm. say that to you because I haven't seen a football game since 2013. I don't share that to impress anybody, but no. to impress upon you, I'm committed. So it doesn't matter to me what happens. It doesn't matter to me what the tenor is. I don't change by the frequency. I'm not on and off around DNI. I'm committed. So what I've learned is that there are too many individuals falling in the category of fragility. You know, their feelings are getting hurt, so they want to run from the conversation. They don't really want to do the work or the fatigue side. You know, we've seen this movie before. The organization talked about it's important, yada, yada, yada. We, we can't afford to check out. So yeah. people like myself, people like Sergio and Dr. Goddard and yourself and so many others, we need to intensify our effort to make sure that we bring people in from the fragility camp, from the fatigue camp, from the not interested camp, from the less than dedicated camp, from the I don't know where to get started camp. We need to bring as many people into this work as possible, because if we give them the latitude. They're simply they going to check down. out. They're going yeah. to absolutely check out. And the final point that I'll say is after George Floyd. So organization said that you know we we we're committing like 58 billion dollars to dni initiatives and racial justice and social uh unrest and all 58 billion was committed june of last year 0.5 percent 0.5 percent had been realized of that money so we cannot afford to give people the latitude and not hold them accountable for doing what they say is important well at least you have a figure um uh... In the Netherlands, I don't know how much we are spending, and I don't. I'm. Ash I feel ashamed to not even know how much we are spending. But let's say that we have a lot to do. So thank you, Torin, for highlighting that. And Sergio. Yeah, I completely want to add to what Torin is saying. I think it's. I mean, that's the difficulty also of today's society, right? Like, okay, so you know, I come from 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 corporate banking, which is exactly what you think it is. It's a bunch of white men in suits doing $100 million deals. And, you know, if you're in that environment, that $100 million deal is the most important thing there is. Mm -hmm. But that's one word. And now, since a year and a half, I'm doing Roots Inspire. I came into this DNI space as a newbie. And already I see my LinkedIn. It's all about DNI. Right? So now we live in a world where these algorithms basically show us what we want to see and what they know we're going to engage on. And I'm telling you, this corporate world that I'm from and this DNI world, they're miles apart, miles yeah. apart, right? So the danger is that us talking here, we'll all agree, right? You know, we'll have different views on how to get to A to B, uh, but we'll all agree. Um, there are plenty of non-believers out there, right? Every manager leader, they've all sort of had their DNI trainings, or you know, it was a topic in the management team. Doesn't mean that they're a believer. And I think we need to start thinking about you know their arguments and start thinking about how we convince them. Um, and and do I, we need honestly, to though? Do we absolutely. need to convince them? Absolutely. Do we need to though? Well, I mean. They're like if you look at corporate life, mm -hmm. they're still running the show. Yeah, the corporates, big corporates are running the world, right? So, I mean, personally, I'm not that believer in like, oh, we'll do our own thing and we'll, you know, I think we need to come together and be part of it. Um, the question is, how do you convince them? And, and personally, I think D and I can use a little bit of a rebranding. I feel that it's too much, you know, the victim role. Mm. I feel it's, it's, it's too much sort of seen as something that, you know, you'll do just to help these poor 
women or these poor minorities or these poor whatever to get a seat at the table, which everybody can relate to, right? But it, it comes into this charitable bucket. So it comes yeah. into this bucket, you know, agenda number nine. You know, when everything is going well, the business is doing fine and, and all the big problems are solved, we get to this DNI issues. And hey guys, what can we do about that? And I think we need to start positioning DNI as what it is. It adds value. Right? Mm -hmm. It adds value to leadership teams. It adds um, different perspectives. It helps in more balanced decision making. It, uh, you know, creativity. There's tons of arguments why DNI adds value today, right now. And then there's the risk management arguments, right? If companies don't get this right, they will lose touch with their employees. They will lose touch with society, and most importantly to them they will lose touch with their clients, right? Yeah. So, so I think once it's branded like that and it's seen like that, it will be agenda point number one, and then things will start moving. Can I add to that? Can mm -hmm. I add to that? Because the one thing, I mean, I do a lot of consulting on D and I for the past years, and what I've always tried to do in order, and it's just a pragmatic approach, it's just to get the work done, is I listen to the white perspective, the white mm -hmm. male wealthy. I Because if I understand where they are coming from and I don't immediately go on the offensive, even yeah. though my emotions will sometimes say, gosh, I really, really do not agree with what, what's being said right now and you're mm -hmm. so wrong. I, I put that away and I'm really pragmatic focusing on what are they saying? Where are they coming from? Because yeah. if I can have the empathy and take their perspective and understand where they are coming from, then I can take them along on a journey. And then I don't have to convince them. Then I go into their world. And I think we do, I really do think we need them. We need we them. Need them. We, we do need them. And I, I, I get you on the part of where you listen to them and then they feel motivated or then they see your hook to connect. But the convincing part, that's that's my personal challenge, right? That's something that I'm going to work on on this year. But I see a lot of comments and a lot of questions, so I'm bringing in. Asil is sharing. How do you set a wage with a, a for a task based employment system? I completely agree on productivity in the UK. It's about two and a half hours a day, and simply, but simply, I'm concerned that we don't we won't pay accurately. So to bring it in, I've noticed that. One of the states in the U.S. has made a law mandatory to add salary transparency. Have you New seen York. that, Torrin? Yeah, yeah that'd be New York. New York's uh, city council voted 41 to 7 to mm -hmm. make pay transparency uh, happen for any employer with four or more employees. So that's number one. And they're not the first state to do it. California mm -hmm. has done it. Massachusetts has done it. And I think there have been a couple of others. And quite frankly, I think it's a, uh, it's a valuable thing for for organizations to do, because at least it sets a conversation that allows me as a candidate to say they are doing what they can to have some degree of equity, some degree of parity inside exactly. of the organization. So I see it as being a good thing. I definitely applaud it. And also having, you know, looking into my past where I've been lured in conversations. And then when you reach at conversation number five, you are being told that this is your number. And I'm just like, no, I communicated a different number. So I would like, people would like to know if whatever you think that, you know, they, however they are adding value, also add your value on paper so that they can see what value, how are you rewarding that value, right? Especially now that we can work everywhere, we can, you know, compare things, we can do a whole audit. If you don't do that and your competitor is doing that and more competitors are doing that, then you're, you're behind, right? On an individual so, level, though, in the Netherlands, it's illegal. It's not, you're not even allowed to do it. You can be transparent about salary for different roles, but not mm -hmm. for what an individual makes. You're not allowed officially, officially yeah. not allowed yeah. to share that. Yeah, true. Yeah, and we've had a number of examples here in the U.S. where people have shared their compensation internally and in some cases externally. 
And quite frankly, in every, well, I shouldn't say every, but in a number of those cases, it has caused a great deal of conversation. In some case, uh, instances, it has caused organizations to change and to do better. In others, they have retreated or retaliated. But I would just simply say, you know, I, I don't think it's a real big deal for me to say to Sergio, hey, this is what I'm making. You know, Sergio shares with me what he's making. Dr. Goddard might share what she's making. And quite frankly, our being secret, we continue to perpetuate the inequity that is taking place. And the organization yeah. is not looking out for us by this band of secrecy. They are mm -hmm. looking out for themselves. Don't get it twisted. So I mm -hmm. think as people, as employees, we need to stick together and simply say, I'm sharing and I want I want Dr. Goddard to have the same thing that I have. We're doing the same job, same tenure, same skill set, same acumen. Let's get it in because I want her to be equally as committed and productive and engaged as I am. Yeah, amazing, amazing. David also shared Colorado and Washington, so many other comments. So uh, Pierre is sharing, the question is not, if we want to we'll go back to the office as before, the question is more, how do we start the transformation of our thinking into the current and the future reality? Leaders in 2022 must activate and encourage innovation because to solve today's problem, we need new ways of thinking. And yeah, you need <laughs> Definitely. And also, uh, Tiraka is sharing. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing your name. And if not, please let me know because I'm here to learn to do better and to pronounce names better. So Tiraka, um, I think many companies haven't comprehended that it's DEI for a reason. You cannot have one without the other. There's a link between all components and they go hand in hand. I totally get that. So thank you for sharing. Jared is sharing core value. And Anna Will is also asking, it, it needs a pitch that states which problems d and I solve for them, the company, hire team. It is proven right? Is it a question, uh, And I'm not sure. Yeah, I think what, uh, and, and, and I'm just guessing, but I think what mm -hmm. Ann is doing is um, picking up on the uh, thread that Sergio dropped around it needing a different shift in branding. understanding, a different branding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sergio's yeah. piece around branding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's all about uh, meritocracy. Mm. <laughs> and I think everybody agrees. Like if you, if you would simplify the world and you say there's two camps, right? There's yay sayers and naysayers. Mm -hmm. Everybody will probably agree that they want a, meritoc a meritocracy, you know, meritocratic um, society. I'm always mm -hmm. talking about the I don't know how, why I brought it up anyway. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you know, there's one one side that's saying, look, um, you know, women, ethnic minorities, what have you, we have we are underrepresented because yeah. the system is not meritocratic. Yeah. Right. Um, and then a lot of companies currently are say are trying to fix the problem of decades, right? So whenever a position opens up at the senior levels, it has to be a woman. Or, you know, I well, et ethnicity is often just like disregarded. It's forgotten. Because, just say it. They just say it. You can't measure it, but but yeah. women, you know, it has to be a woman. And then and then you get in a situation where, you know, an, a white man who's worked his butt off and is, you know, delivering and he is not getting that position because there's no spot, right? Yeah. There, it has to be a woman. So he's not. So that is sort of the backlash we're seeing now. And I think if you want to convince people, I mean, that's their reality. That's their personal, the impact on their personal careers, right? So if you want to convince them, they have to believe in the longer term goal. And they have to understand that, you know, as an organization, you need to go through the pain to basically solve the, 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 the mess you made the last decades. Yeah, I also want to add something on what Sergio is sharing. So in the Netherlands now, we have a law that's that is demanding that um, there is a gender equality in the boards. Um, we, unfortunately, in Europe, in the Netherlands, we look at gender diversity as it's that. 
But when you look into the photos, the images, and when you try to drill down, there's not really a drilling down. There's a lack of intersectionality where you see a lot of white women being favored in those boards. So uh, for the people who are watching this conversation, I want to challenge you to think about the different layers that women have, the different you know layers that they fall into, because now is the, the ideal time to make a difference, to make an impactful difference, and to choose somebody who has the talent, who has the superpowers, but also has a different way of tapping into the ethnic diversity as well, because that part is missed. And that's also why a lot of people are fed up or leaving the workplace too early or starting their their businesses, like myself, uh, because I did not see myself fit within the company. Could that's I add it. something to that as well? Yeah. Because in mm -hmm. addition to like having these quota, <clears throat> I, I understand that they're there. I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, but I think the solution is not there. I think the solution mm -hmm. would be, and here comes the word again, bias. We yeah. need to, if if we want a meritocracy, we need to look at bias in our performance management systems mm -hmm. because we we review performance a certain way and it is rife with bias. Yeah. Every, and, and there are ways within the, with the technological age that in which we're living right now, we can figure out where the bias is and we can solve it. But that's not something that is happening. That's not being emphasized. Instead, we say we need five women on the board, which is, yeah. I mean, it's good. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But only doing that is not going to solve the problem of bias with, and that just impacts succession planning in the long term, mm -hmm. which means you're never going to solve the core of the problem. So yeah. I would put much more effort onto that. Again, looking at inclusion, looking at bias in your systems, than just saying we need a board that is fifty percent female. Which exactly. goes back to the point of which goes back to oh. the point of why, you know, um, and I can't remember who said it, but D and I or D E I B, it's complex work. You know, this is yeah. not just a matter of putting some training in front of individuals. It's not just a matter of are we hiring more of this audience, this group, this community. It absolutely impacts how we are doing philanthropic giving. It's how we are setting our benchmarks for corporate social responsibility or ESG. Exactly. It really yeah. is about how we are putting people in board, how we are establishing mentor, strategic mentor and sponsorship programs inside of our organizations. It's how we develop, inspire, motivate and move people in their career trajectory. It's all of these things. So DNI, for me, I always make sure that I let my clients know. Listen, I'm good, but I'm not a savior. Like I can't do everything that's important in yeah. DNI. I'm good, exactly, but yeah. I can't do everything. And mm -hmm. anyone who comes to you saying that they can do everything through their firm, they're disingenuous. It is mm. complex work. Unless they are Olivia Pope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm I know you are. Kidding. I know you are. I know you are. I'm just, I'm like, Vivian okay. took a trip to fantasy land right there. Yeah. It's all good. I mean, you know, she is in the Netherlands, so there might be some things, you know, up under the desk that we just don't see right now. And I get it. You know, you did say she took a sip a moment don't ago. Don't so. hint. Don't hint. I don't do these extra color career stuff. I'm just I mean, it's your pot. It's your show. It's your show. So let me be quiet. Podcast. It's your show. Sorry. It's your show. It's your show. Torin, you're making me you blush guys, right you... now. It's it, <laughs> let, let me go to the questions. Um, Melvin is sharing. I guess Melvin is your 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 co-partner, right? Melvin's father. So Melvin yes. is sharing becoming part of the decision making level leadership of organization changes paradigm. Then there is less convincing needed for DEI. Yes, Melvin, I love that. And also uh, Tanner is sharing recruiting systems are um, biased and that's another problem as well. And Michael, Michael is in the out. I'm good, but I ain't got. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael got it. Hey, but look, check yeah. this out. You know, but here's the deal to Melvin's mm -hmm. point around yeah. uh, elevating uh, representation into leadership. Yeah. Think about yeah. what NASDAQ did. NASDAQ said in 2020. Yeah. In December of 2020, they said yes. they wanted to, if, if we're going to take a company public or a yeah. company yeah. is going to be yeah. listed, they have yeah. to have a diverse board of representatives. That's what they said. Yeah. yeah. Guess who's giving them pushback? Who? Republican politicians. Mm -hmm. Here in the U.S., 
are sque putting the squeeze on the government saying, don't support that initiative. They are yeah. siding with business leaders saying, uh, no, we're not really trying to force representation at the highest levels in our organization in order to be listed on NASDAQ. So listen, wow. I'm not calling out the Republicans only because we probably got some issues on the Democratic side, the liberal side, the Green Party side. We got some issues. But these damn Republicans? Yeah, so I mean, to me, like the discussion on quota, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big believer that when you get the representation right, the rest will sort of solve itself. I, we, I'm not a believer in that we can put everybody through a training and you know now they understand what bias is and that everybody has it and that all of a sudden their natural behavior is going to change. Mm -hmm. Sure, they're going to be more aware, but when they have to appoint somebody uh, in a leadership role, it's still going to be you know the guy that you that is easy to deal with. You can play golf with them. You can drink a beer with them. You can have a like a real man-to-man -man chat versus that person that you're not sure about. You you don't really understand their culture, or you you know it's just a harder decision. So as long as people don't understand what the goal is and what the benefit is for the organization it's going to be a hard decision for them to make. I yeah. think once you get the representation right, now all of a sudden it's people, you know, people of color or, or women deciding, you know, who the next in line is. And it's at that leadership level where all these different perspectives are represented and where, you know, the leadership bench that is being built is built with all those different perspectives. So yeah. I'm a big believer that once you fix it at the top, it will trickle down. But um, you have to finish. You have to fix inclusion as well there. So it's mm -hmm. not just the representation. It's in, in, diversity in the board and inclusion. Because otherwise you have this person sitting there and nobody will listen to them. That's, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I, and the success stories that I have seen on diverse leadership teams, there was no majority. You know, when, you're, when you have five white men and you put one black female in there to you know have some representation it's going to be tough for all of them right? it's putting that a woman in a in a crocodile pit basically yeah it's not and and for the other side as well huh? it's going to mm -hmm. be like oh what can we say what can we not say it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know oh she doesn't agree with us she it doesn't work i think the the situations i've seen where it does work is there is no majority there's, yeah. you know, a guy, a white guy from this side of the country and a white guy from that side of the country and a white guy from a poor background and a, and a woman. From, you know, everybody is their own individual self and you cannot sort of pick and say, oh, these belong to a similar group. And I think then everybody feels as a minority and all of a sudden everybody's open to listen and open to to hear different perspectives. And because everybody now knows what it feels like. Yeah, right. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take minor issue with that, Sergio. September, Bring it on. September 2015, I remember sitting on a panel in Dallas, and what I said to them in the room in September was that in order for Google to have a report around representation that was substantive enough, that mattered enough to people that are in the DNI space, in order for them to get to a, a respectable number of representation is that they would need to fire half of their people yeah. and then rehire half of them from underrepresented and marginalized communities. Now, at the time, September 2015, Google had around 62,000 employees. What I was getting at is that they needed to be intentional. Prior to them doing that, they're still a successful company, Sergio. That's the part that I'm taking issue with. Because for us to suggest that they can't be successful with it being all one homogenous or whatever, that's not all the way true. They can be very, very successful. What I'm saying is we have to be super intentional. Here's the deal. It's now January of 2022. Google is twice the size that it was in September 2015, and their representation report is exactly the same. Three mm -hmm. to five, maybe six or seven percent. It hasn't moved, yet they doubled an employee headcount. So if you are not constantly intentional around 
every single aspect of representation, of inclusion, components of equity, of promotion, of support. If you are not intentional and full on all the time intentional, you as an organization will slip behind. Yeah. yeah. But so also, there's, there's... what there's something that I would like to add. I uh, mentioned it in the previous conversation, but I will highlight it again. I'm noticing, um, let's say the, the younger generation also sharing their why. Why are they leaving? Why are they skipping out the company? And in a way as a warning, but also as a lesson to the fact that the company isn't as diverse. And these videos are catching on, especially on TikTok. Um, these are the things that managers or companies of today are not really aware of, or they think that a lot of the people aren't, you know, that they aren't visible. What I'm saying is there are ways of the newer generation are communicating and they are sharing a lot more than what I would have shared when I'm leaving a company. I think it would well, be difficult to start. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Sergio. Yeah, no, maybe to, to react on, on what mm -hmm. Turn was saying, but as well as what Vivian was saying. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they can be successful, you know, if they don't fix their DNI issues to a certain level, right? It's not a long-term strategy. Exactly what Vivian is, is, is bringing to the table. If they don't fix it, they'll have a problem. Maybe not today, but five years from now, 10 years from now, they will lose touch with society lose touch with their employees. Yeah. So it is, you know, it is a problem. Um, and and what you were saying as well, Torin, is it's not easy to fix. Like if you want to fix it today and you need to fire half your employees to replace them, that's completely nonsense, right? Like that that's not the way to do it. So I think those companies that really have a dedicated strategy and and understand that it's not an easy fix and it will have, you know, a five year, 10 year plan and there will be a lot of pushback. I think those are the ones that will rise and that will really make a difference between, you know, them and, and companies that are not doing that. Marsha? Now, what I wanted to say was, I think um, it's gonna be difficult to start the new Google to be like a founder in, in, in this era without being diverse and inclusive. I think Google yeah. was founded at a time when well, it was fine. It was not that big of a deal yet. So yeah. now they're already so dominant and so big and they have such a monopoly on their market that they can get away with this right now. In the future, they won't. But I think it, it might be a while because they're really, really big. But if mm -hmm. you start a company now and you want to be as big as Google, the society that we're living in right now with these young people demanding it, now you're not going to be as successful as them if you do it the same way they did it. That's what I think. I want to end and be respectful with the time because we are already what, an hour in. What is your takeaway of today? And I'll start with you, Torin. The wounds of honor are often self-inflicted. Mm. Honor is something that each of us is born with. Honor is something that cannot be given. Honor is something that cannot be taken. It must only not be lost. It was said by Morgan Freeman in The Last Night on Netflix. I want people that are watching to operate and move with honor. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Sergio? Well, um, my takeaway is that it's not an easy thing. Right, like we can always see it in this discussion. Um, there's not a quick fix. It is. It it takes time. It takes determination. Um, and I think you know uh, the job for all of us is to brand it the right way and and get it across the table in the right way and include include everybody in that discussion. And also convince, you know, those that um, are not your standard believers. 
Marcia. That is exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, what I was thinking throughout this whole conversation is we, we disagree on the nuances maybe, but mm -hmm. in, on the whole, we are all on the same page. We're all, yeah. you know, go behind the same cause. So I'm hoping that in the future, we can have more of these conversations that are as respectful as this one was. So not the way we see it on TV, on talk shows, but as respectful as we are talking to each other right now with people who vehemently disagree with us. Yeah, I would like to be able to bridge that gap because then I think we're actually going to get somewhere. So are you inviting people to join? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm open to have a, uh, to have a debate or a conversation um, to see the other side, right? It's not about, well, that's where the convincing part. The thing is in the Netherlands, I translate everything to Dutch. So we have different words for different things. But what I want to do is to to show and to highlight the importance of diversity and equity. And also, I have a son. I know Marcia has a child. I know Sergio has a child. I don't know about you, Torin, but it doesn't matter. We I want to do this right for the next generation. I know there's a lot to be done for this generation, but the next generation, we cannot put the baggage that we have right now, put it on their plate for them to solve. So I want to do as much as I can now. And I am beyond grateful for this conversation. I mean, the heat is on in this room. It was a very nice, constructive, heated conversation. And I really am grateful for everybody who tuned in live and for the people who are listening and watching this later. Um, this is a must replay conversation. So within a few weeks, there will be a summary of this conversation. So thank you all. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Torin. Thank you, Sergio. And for all the audience, thank you for watching. And until next time, next month. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.